there are even more far-fetched theories as to why this break is so popular. I'm Michael Schneider. I have been a teacher, a math teacher, for almost 40 years. A student in my college mathematics class asked me if I had any insights into why the Amen break is so popular. So what I did is I found the waveform of the Amen break, and I measured the distances between the peaks of the waves, and lo and behold, they form golden ratios. And even more surprising, when I took the waveform and matched it up against the human body, the first peak of the wave at the top of the head and the last peak at the bottom of the feet, I found that it corresponded very nicely to the ideal proportions of the human body as described by the ancient Greek ideal. It's really quite astonishing, actually. The golden ratio is a mathematical relationship. It relates the parts to each other and to the whole in the same balanced way, such that the whole is the large part of the large part of the small part. Just like the bones of our finger keep adding, each two bones add to make the next bone, and it extends throughout our whole body. It's complex and simple at the same time. Ah, okay, I think my brain is going to explode now. Here's Fabio with another theory. There's just something, like a hidden meaning in that break. It's got an unbelievable power. I once spoke to someone about the word amen. It's used in Hebrew, it's used in, um, I think, Hinduism, and it's, it's just got this universal meaning. And there is something quite religious about the Amen break because the crowd goes euphoric. More than any other break, you know, there's loads of other breaks. The two-step break, there's the Bobby Bird break, it's, but there's something special about the Amen break. When it kicks in, there's no other break in, in drum and bass that gets the crowd going like the Amen break. Jay Magic and Wicker Man. There was even these guys called the Amen Brothers who used to come out, come to speed. There's about four of them, and they used to go absolutely berserk whenever the Amen came on. Just you couldn't get near them on the dance floor, and they were called the Amen Brothers. They were quite well known in the day. You are like a preacher at a pulpit as a DJ. You're up there trying to kind of like convert everybody and doing your stuff. It's called the aim and break, and it's got this kind of overpowering, overwhelming presence. So, you know, there's got to be something behind the aim and break. There's, there, there is something special, and there's something magical and maybe religious about it as well. Chase and status. The name gives it sort of... Um quite a powerful kind of uh, uh, feeling. grandeur to it, if yeah. you will. But, I mean, I'm going to be super cynical and sorry, Fabs, but there's no, like, religious connotation behind the Amen for me. <laughs> but I guess that's, that's a quite a nice warm theory he had there. There's no end of discussion on the web about the Amen break, with loads of databases and lists of tunes. But one of the most shared Amen links is a sound art installation. Where this drum beat was used to promote some sort of purple pill. It's been used so much, I might argue it's now entered into the collective audio unconscious. Here's the guy who made it. did so about three or four years ago. My name is Nate Harrison. I'm an artist and writer. I live in Brooklyn, New York. It has quite a history to it. This particular drum beat, or rather this break beat. As an artist, I created this sort of sound installation which tells a sort of a history and theory of the I'm in Breaks usage over the last 30 or so years. Receiving a lot of attention and making a lot of money to people, and more importantly, I was interested in who owned the record, and Richard Spencer, who is, I think, the sole living member of the Winstons today, was the copyright holder. After this project, I actually had Richard Spencer and some of the other, I had the son of the bass player for the Winstons get a hold of me. You know, I was at first a little scared to hear from them because I thought they were going to sue me or something like that, and far from it, they were actually extremely happy that I'd made this story. 
they didn't really know what jungle music was or drum and bass music was. They had no idea that a degree with which the Yamen sample has, you know, proliferated across, you know, across the world, really. And they were, you know, they were kind of like, you know, I hate to sort of say it in these blunt terms, but they were, you know, they were like, who, uh, wh what lawyer can I call to sort of recoup my, my thing here? Because, you know, I didn't, I had no idea that this was this huge. So this brings us back to the thorny issue of copyright. Technically, if you release a track which uses a sample from someone else's track, you're supposed to ask for permission. And, usually, you have to pay for it. What better way to pay homage to records that you love but then by like playing with them, you know, musically and rearranging them and recontextualizing them. But not everyone sticks to or agrees with this rule. I've never paid for any sample. I've been nobbled two or three times, like, because I've never paid. I've always had a hard time about beats being something that you should necessarily have to pay for. I believe music is a language and it has to move freely, you know, and we can't have major record labels or major publishing companies, you know, protect uh, certain, like, I don't know, one bars of recording or something and then prevent innovative music from happening. Just before Jungle, about 1990, it was very common for people to sample other people's records and people weren't bothered about it they'd take chunks out of other people's records like whole loops and use it so to find an aiming on somebody else's track and use that was common practice we actually sampled uh, the Mantronics too and I think a lot of other people did as well rather than the, the original Winstons there are so many many different versions of the aim and break within our music there was a sequencing bit of software that came out with one of Dillinger's beats as the standard Eamon beat on it. It didn't even mention his name or anything. I wouldn't do anything about it because I've sampled someone else's drums. I'd be the hypocrite, wouldn't I, really? So, people have been sampling the Eamon break for over 30 years. But according to my research, no members of the Winstons has ever got paid a penny. How do our DJs and producers feel about this? Well... Uh, if I could just go like uh, this for a while, I might answer the question. No, I mean... It's hard to say, isn't it? I would be gutted if I played that drum rate, that, that beat and uh, didn't get any royalty. He's owed a lot of money. Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of records that are based on your rhythm. That's a difficult one. It's your art and, you know, you don't expect to take a Picasso without paying for it. Musicians deserve to get paid. Um, I don't think they deserve to get paid for longer than about... 20 years off of uh, a piece of copyright. I mean, co when copyright started out, it was 14 years long. Now it's life plus 75. I don't think that really makes a lot of sense. That's just basically the corporate mentality and, and generalized greed uh, choking off culture. On one level, I totally understand and I'm feeling that really you should get paid, but James Brown said it and he said, the reason why my career has lasted this long is because of sampling and it's the truth. Their name will go down in history. You know, these guys that made this track, they, they've never done anything else of note, but they will be remembered forever. Maybe in a way that's a form of pay for them. Do you know what I mean? It's immortalised them. 